Welcome back to No Budget Films. In this video, we will go over 10 women in Byzantine history who I consider to be my top 10 Byzantine empresses, where I will be ranking them from 10 to 1, wherein the last will be my top choice. To qualify for this video, the empresses have to come from the period in history from the 4th to 15th centuries and therefore should only be from the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire and should also not include imperial princesses. So keep this in mind that we will not cover any empresses from the Western Roman Empire or from any Byzantine breakaway states. Now the Byzantines surely had its share of powerful women wherein some were even able to have control over their husbands, sons or brothers, who were emperors, while some of these women even seized power for themselves and ruled the empire in their own right. Here in this video, this is exactly what we will cover. However, when ranking these empresses, I will personally rank them not so much based on how much power they wielded, but more so on how interesting their stories were. Now before we begin the video, please don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe to our channel as your support will really help in growing it. And please also check out our latest LEGO Byzantine film, The Imperial Heir, in the description below. First on this list is the 5th century Empress Pulcheria, the older sister of the Emperor Theodosius II, who she greatly influenced. Pulcheria was born in 399 as the daughter of the Emperor Arcadius and his wife the Empress Aelia Eudoxia. In 408 her father the Emperor had died whereas her mother had already died some years back. Thus her younger brother Theodosius II despite being a child was made Emperor under the regency of Constantinople's prefect or mayor Anthemius. However by 414 Pulcheria assumed the role as her brother's guardian at the age of only 15 while also taking the title of Augusta or Empress. Thus she would be the one to greatly influence him especially in terms of religious policy. As Empress, Pulcheria was known for her extreme religious zeal while also taking a vow of chastity and as the power behind her brother's rule, she influenced him to wage an inconclusive war against the Sassanid Persians over religious matters and to summon the church council of Ephesus in 431. Eventually Pulcheria's influence over her brother would not last as when Theodosius married, he now would rely more and more on his wife until they separated and thus Pulcheria returned to power. Even after Theodosius' death in 450 from a horse riding accident, Pulcheria still commanded such power and influence as despite taking a vow of chastity, she married the military officer Martian who then became the new emperor wherein she would still remain the power behind him, again especially when it came to religious policy. As the wife of Martian, she helped in organizing the church council of Chalcedon in 451, though just two years later in 453 she would die while her husband followed her in death some four years later in 457. Zoe Carbonopsina, whose surname literally meant coal black eyes, came into the picture in the early 10th century as empress, being the fourth and final wife of the Emperor Leo VI Wise, also being the wife that finally produced him a son and heir, Constantine VII Porphyrogenitus. Leo VI however died in 912 and was thus succeeded by his brother Alexander, who banished both Zoe and her son Constantine. But after just a year Alexander was dead, leaving the young Constantine VII taking over as emperor and inheriting a war with Byzantium's northern neighbor, the Bulgarian Empire of Simeon, a war Alexander started. The young Constantine was thus put under the regency of the Patriarch of Constantinople, Nicolaus, who banished Zoe to a nunnery. Though with Nicolaus handling the conflict with Bulgaria badly, he lost his position as the young emperor's regent to Zoe, who then took over her son's regency. Although Zoe was another powerful woman in Byzantine history, she was still unable to rule alone and so she shared power with several aristocrats, most notably the general Leo Focus the Elder. Zoe's regency was at first successful as the Byzantines defeated an Arab invasion in 915, but her position as Empress Regent would fall apart following the catastrophic defeat of the Byzantine forces led by Leo Focus to Simeon's Bulgarians at the Battle of Ankylos in 917. Zoe though would try to save her position and that of Focus by attempting to marry him. But this would not happen as Focus before seizing power was blinded by his rival, the Admiral Romanos de Capenos, who eventually seized the throne from young Constantine VII in 920, taking over as senior emperor and in the process banishing Zoe, who would thus disappear from the historical records. Sophia is among two very powerful women in 6th century Byzantium, 
the other being her aunt, the Empress Theodora, who we will go over later. Just like her aunt wielded great influence over her husband, the Emperor Justinian I the Great, Sophia would follow in her footsteps and be the one to greatly influence her husband, Justinian's nephew and successor Justin II, who came to power in 565. Like no other empress before her, Sophia had the audacity to place her image on imperial coins alongside her husband while she also had statues of herself made right next to her husband as well. As the power behind her husband Justin II, she had a part in the murder of his cousin also named Justin, who posed as a rival to him, and in the recalling of the old general Narses from Italy. Following a number of defeats the Byzantines suffered against the Sassanid ruler Khosrow I, the Emperor Justin II lost his sanity, thus making him unfit to rule. Therefore, his wife Sophia assumed full control over the empire, ruling in his stead. Together with Justin's trusted commander and later adopted son Tiberius, who in 474 was made Caesar. As a powerful personality, however, Sophia was not content in sharing power with Tiberius. Thus, they would frequently clash over financial policies. Eventually, in 578, Justin II died and was then succeeded by Tiberius as the sole emperor or Augustus. And although Sophia was allowed to stay as Augusta, she was no longer the ruling empress. Furious about not being in power anymore, first she tried to force Tiberius to divorce his wife and marry her so that she still stays in power, which however failed and so Sophia at one point plotted to overthrow Tiberius and replace him with a certain Justinian. Tiberius II's rule however did not last long, as in 582 he died and was thus succeeded by his son-in-law Maurice, though Sophia at least still kept her title as Augusta which would be held by three others including Tiberius' widow Anastasia and her daughter the new Empress Constantina. Sophia was last mentioned in historical sources in 601, which suggests she may have also died that year. Part of this list too includes the last Byzantine or Roman Empress, and this was Helena Dragas, wife of the Emperor Manuel II Palaiologos and mother of the Empress John VIII and Constantine XI, the last Emperor. Helena, originally a Serbian princess, was born in 1372 to the Serbian feudal lord Konstantin Dejanovic, who was also an Ottoman vassal, while in 1392, at the age of 20, she would marry the Byzantine emperor Manuel II. Together they would have six children, in which all were boys, and these were the future emperor John VIII, the future despot of the Morea Theodore II, future despot of Thessaloniki Andronikos, the future emperor Constantine XI, and the future despots of the Morea Dimitrios and Thomas. Nothing much though is said about Helena during her time as Empress Consort for Manuel II, but following Manuel's death in 1425, she retired to a nunnery in Constantinople while her eldest son John VIII ruled as Emperor, and during this time Helena was known to have established a home for the elderly in Constantinople. Helena returns to the picture following John VIII's death in 1448, and due to having no children, power struggle broke out among his younger surviving brothers Constantine, Demetrios, and Thomas. Here, Helena, now very old, took over the empire's regent, thus making her the last empress to rule Byzantium, and as regent she pushed for her son, the despot of the Maria Constantine, the eldest of three brothers and her favorite son to be emperor, wherein Helena even asked permission from Byzantium's overlord, the Ottoman Sultan Murad II, to approve Constantine as emperor. The request was approved, and thus Constantine XI Palaiologos was crowned as emperor in 1449, and having no wife at this time, his mother Helena remained as empress until her death in 1450, at the old age of 78. Since Constantine XI remained unmarried throughout his time as emperor, until his death at the fall of Constantinople in 1453, Helena was thus the last Roman empress, and as a fun fact, Constantine XI used the name Dragasis in honor of his mother as the Greek translation of her Serbian last name Dragas. Other than that, it is definitely a coincidence that the last Byzantine emperor, just like the first one, was named Constantine, all while both their mothers were named Helena. One of the most well-known Byzantine empresses is Zoe Porphyrogenita from the 11th century, and she therefore makes it to this top 10 empresses list, not so much because of the power she wielded, but more so because of how interesting her story was. Zoe was born in 978 as the daughter of Constantine VIII, who ruled alongside his older brother Basil II as his co-emperor. During the time her uncle Basil II was emperor, Zoe and her sisters were forbidden from marrying anyone in the empire as this could allow their potential husbands to pose a threat to the Byzantine throne, though they were at least allowed to marry foreign princes. In 1002, Zoe was arranged to marry the Holy Roman Emperor Otto III, and so she was sent off to Germany only to return home when finding out that Otto had died, and so Zoe would remain single for the next decades to come. In 1025, Basil II died and was thus succeeded by his younger brother Constantine VIII, who just three years later died 
wherein Zoe this time, who was already 50, was selected as a bride for the German Prince Henry, who was only 10. This marriage, however, did not push through, and so before his death, Constantine VIII forced the mayor of Constantinople, Romanos Argyros, to marry Zoe. Thus, following Constantine's death, they were married, wherein Romanos III was emperor with Zoe as his empress. This marriage, however, did not succeed as they failed to produce children due to their old age. That was even said that they tried using magical potions to produce children, which also didn't work. Zoe eventually fell in love with Michael the Paphlagonian, a courtier decades younger than her, and it was even said that they together plotted to kill Romanus in 1034 by drowning him in his bath. Whether or not they were behind Romanus' death, Romanus still died, and so Michael IV succeeded as emperor with Zoe as his empress after of course bribing the Patriarch of Constantinople to crown them. Again, the marriage of Zoe and Michael did not work out as Michael preferred to rule alone, thus confining Zoe to the palace. And when Michael suddenly died in 1041, he refused her from seeing him. Following Michael IV's death, Zoe then adopted his nephew also named Michael who succeeded as emperor. Although not wanting Zoe to rule with him, he banished her from the capital only for the people to riot in favor of returning Zoe. The new emperor Michael V thus restored Zoe to power but shortly after Michael V was overthrown and blinded by the mob, whereas Zoe now ruled as empress for the next two months, together with her younger sister Theodora. The rule of two women however was not well accepted in the empire, and so Zoe had to marry again, this time to her old lover Constantine Monomachus, who became the new emperor Constantine IX, while Zoe continued to rule as his empress consort until her death in 1050. Just five years later, Constantine IX followed her in death in 1055 and was thus succeeded by Theodora as the sole empress for just a year until her death in 1056, which then put an end to the Macedonian dynasty. When it comes to the late Byzantine era, the one woman who sure held real power and was always hungry for it was the Empress Anna of Savoy from the 14th century. Though originally from northern Italy, Anna would become the Byzantine Empress consort after marrying the Emperor Andronicus III Palaiologos, with whom she would have three children with, including the next Emperor, John V Palaiologos. Anna, however, was not influential during her husband's reign, and thus it was only after his untimely death in 1341 when she began showing real power and influence when she more or less started the civil war against her late husband's trusted friend and general, John Cantacuzinus, who put a claim on the throne challenging Andronicus and Anna's young son, John V. This destructive Byzantine civil war, then, was fought between the faction of the Empress Anna consisting of the empire's progressive people, including commoners and merchants, versus the faction of Cantacuzinus, supported by the more conservative nobility. At first, it may have seemed that Anna's faction was winning the civil war, as she was supported by Bulgaria and later by Serbia while she too had the luck of having the powerful admiral Alexios Apokalkos on her side who managed to repel Cantacuzino's faction from Thessaloniki a number of times. However, no matter how powerful Anna was, fortunes would quickly turn around for her when Alexios was killed by prisoners all while Anna had to pawn Byzantium's crown jewels to Venice to raise funds. Eventually, Cantacuzinos gained the upper hand after getting support from the Ottoman Beylik of Orhan and thus in 1347, Cantacuzinos took over Constantinople forcing Anna to surrender before making an agreement to co-rule what was left of the empire with John V. Due to her defeat in the civil war, Anna chose to retire from politics and reside in Thessaloniki, where she was at least still in charge of it, yet she even controlled its mint. Anna would die in Thessaloniki in 1365, while the Byzantine Empire at this point would slowly die out. It is basically for the reason of being someone who could take charge of an empire in the civil war and lead her own faction why Anna of Savoy makes it to this list. One of the most influential figures of 9th century Byzantium was the Empress Theodora, and not to confuse her with the more famous Theodora, who we shall talk about later. Here we will simply refer to her as Theodora the Armenian. Now, Theodora is known as such, as she is possibly of Armenian origin, being born to a merchant family of Armenian descent in Paphlagonia in 815. It was due to her being chosen in a bride show by the Emperor Theophilos of the Amorian dynasty why she became Empress, first as Empress Consort Theophilos. Although Theophilos was an iconoclast or simply someone who opposed religious icons, Theodora was the opposite, being a strong iconophile that continued venerating icons despite being married to an iconoclast, and despite the differences of their views, Theodora still produced seven children with him. Following Theophilos' sudden death in 842, at a relatively young age, Theodora took control of the empire as empress regent for her young son, the Emperor Michael III, and as regent, she was practically the absolute ruler herself. Theodora's first act as regent was to finally once and for all end iconoclasm for good, 
and this was done by removing the Patriarch of Constantinople John VII and replacing him with the iconophile Methodius I. In the meantime, despite her young age at this point, Theodora still held real power, all while she also ran the empire with competent ministers such as the eunuch Theoctistos, who was basically the power behind her rule. Theodora, however, aside from having a powerful reputation, also had a bloodthirsty one, as seen with the massacre of thousands of Paulicians, a heretical Christian sect, which she ordered. In the meantime, Theodora also organized a number of military expeditions against the Bulgarians in the north and Arabs in the south. However, many of these expeditions ended in failure, including an attempt to recover Crete from Arab pirates and Sicily from an invading Arab force. However, she was at least successful in sending a Byzantine fleet to raid the coasts of Arab Egypt in 853 and in organizing the successful Byzantine sack of Arab-held Anazarbus in Asia Minor in 855. As a fun fact, Theodora even threatened the Bulgarian ruler Boris that she would personally lead the Byzantine army against his forces, though this never happened. Despite wielding a lot of power and influence, Theodora was not able to hold on to it for a long time, as when her son Michael III came of age, she forced him to marry a woman he did not like, thus giving Michael the sense that his mother might remove him from power and rule alone. Michael III thus conspired together with his uncle Bardas, Theodora's brother, to remove her from power, and so together they had the powerful eunuch Theoctistus assassinated. Without Theoctistus to back her anymore, Theodora lost power and so Michael proclaimed himself as sole emperor in 856, therefore banishing his mother to a nunnery. Theodora thus remained in the nunnery for the rest of her life until her death in 867, shortly after her son Michael III was killed and usurped by his protector Basil the Macedonian, who became Emperor Basil I and therefore establishing the Macedonian dynasty. Now, for her role in restoring icon veneration for good, Theodora is therefore considered the saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Less than a century before Theodora the Armenian was another Byzantine empress similar to her, although more ambitious and ruthless, and this was Irene of Athens, the first woman in Byzantine history to rule alone in her own right. Born in Athens in 752 and orphaned at a young age, Irene came to Constantinople in 769 to marry the imperial heir Leo IV, son of the iconoclast extremist emperor Constantine V of the Isaurian dynasty. Following the death of Constantine V in 775, his son Leo IV took over as emperor with Irene as his empress consort, while they too had a son being the future emperor Constantine VI. Leo IV's reign, although militarily successful, was rather short as after just five years, he died at only 30 in 780. Therefore, with her son Constantine too young to rule alone, Irene took the role as empress regent, something she would never want to let go of even if her son would come of age. When becoming Empress Regent, Irene already removed all threats to her rule, which included her late husband's troublemaking half-brothers, who she exiled and turned into monks, all while she already began asserting herself as the effective ruler of the empire by putting her image on the front of coins, while putting her son's image only on the back as if he did not matter. Irene perhaps is most remembered for putting an end to the first period of iconoclasm in 787, and thus making icon veneration fully legal again at the Council of Nicaea, as Theodora, as mentioned earlier, was the one responsible for completely ending iconoclasm. In her time as Empress Regent as well, Irene's trusted eunuch general Staurakios managed to recapture most of Greece from the Slavs, however she was not entirely successful in battling the Arabs in the east. Eventually Irene's position would be challenged by her son Constantine VI when he came of age to rule, and thus Irene was briefly removed from power until her son screwed up the empire when suffering a humiliating defeat to the Bulgarians in 792, thus forcing Irene to take back power. Although with Irene back in power as regent, the rivalry with her son would continue to last for years until Irene managed to seize power from him completely in 797, where she went as far as having him blinded in order to take power for herself. Now as the sole ruler of the empire, Irene referred to herself not as Empress or Basilissa, but as Basileus or Emperor a number of times. However, she was not entirely a competent ruler as she primarily focused on pleasing her people by lowering taxes and giving away money rather than focusing on strengthening the empire. In the West, meanwhile, it so happened during Irene's reign as sole ruler in 800 when the Frankish King Charlemagne was crowned Roman Emperor in the West. Thus Byzantium was no longer the only Roman Empire around. In the knack to unite both empires being Charlemagne's Frankish Empire and Byzantium, Irene agreed to a marriage with Charlemagne, though this however never came to happen as this marriage proposal only led to Irene losing support from the people and nobility who did not want the Western barbarian to rule them if she married him. Eventually in 802, a conspiracy by the nobility managed to successfully depose Irene and thus replace her as emperor with her finance minister Nikephoros I, whereas Irene was banished to the island of Lesbos, dying there just one year later. And now here's the more famous Empress Theodora, as mentioned earlier, 
who is for sure the most famous of Byzantine empresses. True enough, this Theodora from the 6th century is the wife of perhaps Byzantium's most famous and influential emperor, Justinian I the Great. Now, despite how much power and influence Theodora had in her time as empress, she had very humble origins, born in Byzantine Cyprus in 500, whereas her father was a bear trainer and her mother a dancer. When very young, Theodora's father died, while her mother presented her and her two sisters to the Blue Faction, and thus serving the Blue Faction of the Empire, Theodora grew up to be a dancer and actress like her mother, although some sources accuse her of being a prostitute, but back then actresses were seen to be equivalents of prostitutes, and thus at the bottom of society. Eventually, Theodora fell in love with a Syrian official, who later on abandoned her, leading to Theodora finding herself in Alexandria, wherein she converted to the Monophysite sect of Christianity. When back in Constantinople, Theodora would meet her future husband Justinian, who was then known as Flavius Petrus Sabatius, and about 18 years older than her. Though there was a law in place that patrician men like Petrus, who although also came from humble origins, could not marry actresses. Petrus, however, convinced his uncle, the Emperor Justin I, to change this law, which he did, and thus Petrus and Theodora married on the condition that Theodora repented from her old ways of being an actress. Following Justin I's death in 527, Petrus succeeded him as Emperor Justinian I, with Theodora as Empress, and as Empress, she would advise him on numerous occasions. It was Theodora who was behind some of the policies created by Justinian, especially when it had to do with women's rights, including divorce settlements and for women to inherit property. Though it was also Theodora that convinced Justinian to brutally put down the massive Nika riot of 532 with force. Now in 532, a massive riot broke out in Constantinople, wherein the blue and green factions joined forces in plotting to overthrow Justinian to the point of burning down most of the city and the imperial palace. With the riots going out of hand, Justinian contemplated fleeing the capital until Theodora persuaded him that it would be better to die than lose the throne. Thus Justinian sent out the troops, led by the generals Belisarius and Mundo, to rush into the Hippodrome and kill the rioters, and thus at the end of the day, 30,000 rioters were mercilessly killed, and therefore saving Justinian's and Theodora's positions. With the riots over, Justinian and Theodora focused on reconstructing Constantinople at a much grander scale. And yes, Theodora had a major part to play here again. As the Empress Consort, Theodora had an active role in court politics, as it was she that exiled the finance minister John of Cappadocia, recalled the general Belisarius, who she was jealous of a number of times, installed Monophysite bishops across the empire, and somewhat created a succession plan for Justinian by marrying off her niece Sophia, as mentioned earlier, to Justinian's nephew Justin, as true enough Justinian and Theodora never produced children. When plague hit the empire in 542, wherein Justinian himself even fell victim to it, Theodora ran the empire for him as regent, as Justinian fell into a coma. Justinian though soon enough recovered from the plague, and thus continued ruling together with Theodora. But just six years later in 548, Theodora sadly died at the age of 48, thus leaving Justinian heartbroken for life that he chose to never marry again until his death in 565, for basically asserting her dominance in the male-dominated Byzantine Empire and being actually effective in running it despite meeting a premature end, Theodora deserves to be second place on this list, as first place goes to someone I personally think has a more interesting story. But before we get there, let us go through some honorable mentions. First place on this list goes to someone who some may find obscure, and this is the Empress Ariadne from the late 5th and early 6th centuries. Now if you ask me why I put Ariadne at first place, this is because I find her story interesting, as she true enough saw so many crucial events happening throughout her lifetime, and more so from a position of power, which is a very rare case for a historical figure. Throughout her lifetime, Ariadne has always been in a position of power, being the daughter of an emperor, wife of two emperors, mother of an emperor, and even a niece of an emperor. Now Ariadne was born in around 450 to the Thracian military officer Leo and his wife Verina, who was also from the Balkans. When she was only 7 years old in 457, her father Leo was proclaimed emperor by the powerful general Aspar, who Leo eventually killed when not wanting to be under the influence of a barbarian. In 467, when Ariadne was only 17, she was married off to the Isaurian chieftain Terasikodisa, who became her father's top general and renamed as Zeno who eventually replaced Aspar as the Eastern Roman Empire's top general following Aspar's assassination in 471. Together, Zeno and Ariadne had a son named Leo after his grandfather, 
who then succeeded his grandfather Leo I as emperor following Leo I's death in 474. The child emperor Leo II, who although was emperor only in name, as his father Zeno ran the empire for him, would however die within the same year 474, possibly from a plague, and would thus be succeeded by his father as sole emperor. Zeno's rule, however, would only last for two months, as in early 475, he was overthrown in a coup by Ariadus mother Verena and uncle Basiliscus, who was Verena's brother, wherein Basiliscus usurped Zeno as emperor and proved to be very incompetent that Zeno eventually took back the throne in 476, thus putting Basiliscus to death in a very slow way. As emperor, Zeno's reign was true enough to unstable, as he was challenged by ambitious generals and politicians a number of times, true to his Isaurian origins, which the people of Constantinople saw as primitive. Ariadne true enough came into conflict with her husband Zeno over the fate of her mother Verena, who Zeno locked up in prison as Ariadne wanted her release, to which Zeno refused. Both Verena and Ariadne thus organized a plot to kill the Isaurian general Illus, who held Verena in prison. But this ended in failure, with the assassin only cutting off Illus's ear, thus leading to Illus rising up in rebellion against Zeno, believing Zeno plotted to kill him. Illus's rebellion would however be crushed in 488 by Zeno's forces, with Illus slain, and thus Zeno would rule unchallenged with his wife Ariadne for the next three years until Zeno's death by epilepsy in 491. Legend says that Ariadne had Zeno buried alive when seeing him get an epileptic seizure, though these were only rumors made to slander the unpopular Emperor Zeno. Following Zeno's death, it was Ariadne who decided the future of the empire by marrying the finance minister Anastasius, who thus became the new emperor, and as emperor, Anastasius I had truly improved Byzantium's economy big time. However, during Anastasius I's reign, Ariadne would remain inactive until her death in 515. True enough, barely anyone in history saw so many crucial events around them in their lifetime in a position of power the way Ariadne did, as she true enough witnessed the rise of the Leonid dynasty with her father becoming emperor in 457, the murder of Aspar in 471, which put an end to Germanic barbarian influence in the Byzantine army, the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476, the unstable reign of Zeno, and the rise of Byzantium's golden age under Anastasius I. Ariadne is surely the person who can be called the bridge connecting the hard times of the 5th century to the age of stability and prosperity in the early 6th century, and she could have even possibly encountered the young Flavius Petrus Sabatius in Constantinople, who would later become the most influential emperor Justinian I. Another reason to why I put Ariadne at first place was mainly because she put the Byzantine Empire in the right direction by marrying the highly competent Anastasius and thus making him emperor, as his smart economic policies would pave the way for this golden age of Justinian in the 6th century. And now we have come to the very end of the list and selecting which empresses go to this list was something very fun, especially since all of them had more or less interesting stories. Through their stories of how they were able to hold real power and run the empire surely shows that women had an important part to play in the mostly male-dominated Byzantine Empire, whether in staging wars the way Anna of Savoy did, playing a crucial role as the power behind the throne the way Pulcheria did, courageously seizing power the way Irene did, and making reforms the way Theodora did. The stories of these empresses true enough show that Byzantium was the kind of empire where women had a say, which therefore makes Byzantium's story ever more interesting. Now, before we end, please let me know if you agree with this top 10 empresses list or not. And if you don't agree, please let me know in the comments. And please don't forget to subscribe to my channel as your support really helps. Once again, thank you for watching this video and see you again for another Byzantine history video.